everybody, and welcome back to the Swift AI uh, uh, Com Security and Compliance uh, Podcast. Uh, very, very excited to introduce our guest here today. Uh, Annabelle, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, thanks, Jeremy. I'm really excited to be here. Uh, my name is Annabelle Sullivan, and I have worked as an operator for almost two decades. Um, the shape of my career trajectory has not been linear, and I'm sure we'll talk about that here in a bit. It's mm -hmm. been more of a, a journey of all over the place, but I've worked in the beauty industry. I transitioned into climate. I won't say that I've seen everything. I haven't seen it all, but I've seen I've seen most of it. So happy to talk about the adventure along the way. And currently I work at a startup called Nithio, where I am head of people and operations. Awesome. And very, very excited to dive into Nithio in a second and as well as your career learnings as well. Uh, but hey, everybody, uh, intro for me. I'm Jeremy, account executive of Swift AI, a device management platform for over 100 teams, teams like Violet X, Symbol AI, uh, and immediate love Swift because they save over 100K and 600 hours annually on managing, uh, meeting compliance, uh, managing their devices, um, automating onboarding and offboarding, and uh, with Swift's help, meeting compliance to close uh, big sales deals uh, with big clients. So let's dive right into it. Um, Annabelle, could you tell us a little bit more about Nithio? Yeah, absolutely. So the short version is that Nithio is a, an AI-enabled climate finance platform. And we're also a mission-driven company. So our mission is really to catalyze billions of dollars of capital. So it's not a small, it's not a small goal to address climate change and to achieve universal energy access in an equitable way. And now we do that uh, through two main approaches. The first is that we've built what we call a risk analytics engine. And that's really like a one-of-a-kind credit scoring tool that we deploy in Sub-Saharan Africa. And to develop that, we used um, data, AI, machine learning. So all of the buzzwords, but that's been our approach for five years. Uh, the second way that we achieve that mission is through our own uh, investment vehicle. It's called FAIR, which stands for uh, the Facility for Adaptation, Inclusion, and Resilience. And through FAIR, we actually invest across the region. Um, and we have some kind of innovative approaches there. One of them is using like a gender lens through our financing. So I think we're a little bit of an interesting company in that we do have those two distinct verticals. And obviously the teams have very different skill sets between them, but coming together, I think they have complementary approaches. Very interesting. Um, several points here. I'd love to understand you mentioned the solution is to solve, uh, uh, make climate more equitable, right? Climate solutions. I'd love to understand if you could help our audience understand the, the problem statement. Yes. Uh, where is the world right now? Where is the inequity? Yeah. Yeah, it's great. It's it's quite a problem. And it's a great question, right? Because the, the problem set is pretty broad. Our focus is in sub-Saharan Africa. And so essentially by 2030, which... I think we hear that year all the time, and that's just six years from now, right? So that's very near term. But by 2030, nine out of 10 people living without electricity will be in sub-Saharan Africa. So that's our focus. In order to achieve uh, universal energy access, what we really have to do is scale off-grid energy, right? So a lot of the, the customers in sub-Saharan Africa can't be served by the grid. So simply extending what exists now is, is not a solution, right? So what we need to do is to allow those off-grid energy companies to scale, to receive investment, and that's just not happening right now. And it's not happening for a couple of reasons. Um, the first is that these operators, these, these companies aren't able to determine which end users can pay and which can't. So if we think of Africa in relation to the U.S., there isn't a credit score in Africa, right? So there's no way to determine who can pay and, and who can't. Um, so investors who would maybe invest in these companies in this industry, they can't forecast cash flow. So they're not going to come into the into the space and inject the capital that's needed. Right. Mm -hmm. So so this has created a real a real bottleneck in both funding and in growth. We need both. 
Um, and so again, our approach is to uh, leverage data, leverage AI, and to standardize that credit risk, right? So we wouldn't call it a credit score, but we're standardizing the credit risk. And we're able to do that with anonymous uh, customer data. We use geospatial data, socioeconomic data, all sorts of stuff. And our output is that standardized risk assessment. And so that's what we uh, provide to other investors. And then, of course, we also use that our, ourselves, right, to to invest um, in a competitive and, and sustainable way. I'm curious, uh, how... How how does AI come into play? Why um, um, did Nithio choose to use AI? I understand you have a lot of data and you want to analyze it. You want to generate a, you know, an analysis uh, of it. Um, uh, yeah. 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 It's a good question. Uh, so we have a full data team, data science team. We have data analysts, data scientists, data engineers, and you know, this problem isn't unique to Nithio, but I think what we've seen over the past maybe couple of decades is this real increase in the availability of data, right? There's a lot of data out there, but a lot of it is not being put to use. So yeah. we use open source data. Some of it is open source and some of it is proprietary. Again, I mentioned a few different kinds, but what we need to do with all of that data that's out there is do all of that data cleaning, right? And then train models, whether it's machine learning, AI, to allow us to accurately assess across the whole African continent, right? Which, as you can imagine, very different uh, profiles from country to country, city to city, but allow us to standardize what does that risk look like, right? And we use those different factors. Maybe it's based on household size or based on gender or based on, we can also incorporate weather data. There's all sorts of mm. different um, factors there. But yeah, for us, that was the best approach because of the, the number of factors, I think, that the AI and the machine learning really allows us to standardize the output. Very cool. And and just uh, to, to clarify my understanding, um, the result uh, of Nithio is you have this analysis or this report or this this aggregated data, and, and who is it for? Is it for for investors? That's right. Yeah, it would be for investors, and again, we use it right, so we use our own data. Right. But we we call it the portfolio portal. But essentially, yes, there's investors out there who um, are wondering, yeah, where would the areas be where we would be looking to deploy capital, right? And and businesses as well, they want to know okay, in Nairobi, what is the repayment rate like, right? Maybe for a certain household, maybe for a certain neighborhood, but yeah, multiple different customers out there. Very cool. I also find it very interesting that you dog food your own technology, you use it, right? You're investors yourself. Yeah, um, we're invested. I'm curious, what was the motivation behind that? Was Nithio originally investors and needed a tool to develop one? Or you develop a tool and you went, oh, we need to use it ourselves and be our own customer? Or that there's yeah. a big market here, right? Yeah, that's a good question. I think from uh, our founding, which was in 2018, we were uh, kind of the the thought or the result of a venture builder called Cupanda Capital. I think it was both, right? That we they saw that the data existed, right, and that the data needs to be put to some some use, right, and that there is also um, with with our founders, with our CEO Kate and some of the other founders, they have a background in banking, right, in the development world. So I think it was just kind of a natural. Um, culmination, right? Of all right, well, we have the data, we have a solution, which is we need to deploy capital, and the two just really came together really nicely. I think that's um, it just you know my own comment on here. I think that's uh, where some of the best products come from, uh, where the people building the team building the product is using it. You know, you're using it yourself. Um, uh, several years ago, I made a, an events, uh, a metaverse, a VR events platform. And um, it was actually because we were event organizers hosting conferences. And that just sort of allowed us to be the first to experience all the problems and all the bugs and issues, but also go, actually, this is my use case. Can we ask for this? Can we have this feature? Yeah. Can we have this update? Um, yeah, I love I love that dynamic between, between the teams. Um, so I wanted to switch gears a little bit to your role as head of people in operations. Um, uh, you know, various different companies could have different meanings for that role. What does that uh, mean for you? What's a day in the life of uh, Annabelle? 
Yeah. Yeah. It's a good question. Yeah. In the startup world, titles are kind of somewhat meaningless, right? Because you have to know, okay, what is the size of the company? What's the stage? And so just to give that background, we are, we're about 27 people. Um, when I joined about a year and a half ago, we were only 18. So from wow. a headcount perspective, yeah, we've grown maybe almost 40%. So I lead everything related to people, which is things like recruiting, hiring, onboarding, thinking about learning and development, um, career development, developing things like right now performance reviews, right? So that was something that I built last year when I joined and we're now in our second year. So we're, we did a lot of that job leveling, job ladders, um, there's some other stuff on the people side, right? Like the traditional HR piece, right? Laws, regulations, the the less fun stuff. <laughs> and then on the operational side, it's everything from managing our IT consultants. Um, you know, we work globally, right? So we have a lot of global regulations and GDPR and all sorts of things in terms of data to think about. We also are scaling, right? As I said, so I think a lot on a day-to-day -day basis about what systems do we need in place as we grow, as we scale, what resources, whether that be training or people or consultants. So, you know, I think this is maybe a little cliche, but my day is never the same. It's always <laughs> different. Sometimes there's fires to put out, but for the most part, my focus this year has been on building a world-class company, right? So getting a little bit out of that bootstrap or that real startup phase and moving into more of a growth, sustainable phase. I, I want to ask you about that in a second, but um, wow, you do so much from, uh, you know, hiring, training, uh, performance reviews and all the way to, to managing IT and, and GDPR compliance. I'm curious, um, uh, because you work, I imagine, right in in the fintech uh, mm -hmm. industry with finance. Finance itself comes, at least I know in the U.S. has a lot of uh, regulations as well, uh, compliance uh, regulations. Yep. Um, in addition to GDPR, what other uh, compliance uh, do you do you need to think about, or do you need to need to meet? Yeah, we're starting to think about that. I wouldn't say starting. Actually, we've been thinking about this for a while, but because of our size and our assets under management, we're not quite at the size where we're going to be regulated by the SEC in the next year or maybe two. But it's certainly something that's on our radar because, yes, as you mentioned, in the U.S., there are a lot of strict regulations, kind of similar to GDPR, which is pretty yeah. onerous, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, it, it's something that I talk a lot to our CFO about and our general counsel. And so, yeah, that's another aspect, right? Is thinking about from a compliance standpoint, just generally, what do we need? Absolutely. Um, you mentioned uh, a lot of your work today is transitioning from the bootstrapped, you know, what, what the theme was in 2018 to uh, more structured. I, I, I wanted to ask you, what is your strategy? What is your methodology to do that, to make that transition? Is it is it process? Is it culture? Is it, yeah, what is it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, it's probably all of the above. You know, mm -hmm. it's not, it's definitely not a, there isn't, I guess, a one size fits all solution. Unfortunately, there, there isn't a, and I talk about this a lot with friends and ops, there's no playbook from going to, from 20 oh, to yeah. 30 to 50, unfortunately. And I think what can sometimes complicate things is that you have to pivot, right? I mean, we might be focused more on the data solution for a couple of years. Now we're more focused on the investment side of the business. So that will inform the solutions that I develop. Um, I think some of it is certainly process. And I know that that can be, people maybe get a little put off by that term, right? I don't oh. want to think that it's a bureaucracy or it's red tape, but I spend a lot of time explaining to folks, I think that if you build in some of that infrastructure when you're smaller, it becomes a lot easier as you scale. Something like a compensation philosophy, we have to be able to explain why do we pay what we pay. Mm -hmm. We have to be able to explain, right? If you and I are both a director, 
all right, what does that mean? Are our jobs the same? Are we at, at, at the same level? Are we doing the same kind of work? So it's a lot of that. And it's also just org design, right? Thinking about if, if these are our OKRs or our KPIs, what resources do we need to drive those? And so, um, yeah, it's a lot of strategic thinking, but then there's also the tactical day-to-day, right? Of I don't have a, a large team. The, the team that I do have is great, but we're tiny. So a lot of it, I'm I'm a individual contributor, and then I'm also trying to zoom out and think about the strategy behind it. Wow, very, very interesting. Um, and no, I, I don't think, uh, I, I think our audience of, of people operations managers would uh, agree with you 100% uh, on, on the process, and especially what you said, if you set them in early, Right, it helps you scale. Uh, it reduces a lot of the pain points and risks that you that that happen later on. I'm curious just to hear your opinion on this, the importance of uh, managing operations the way you do and and people the way you do doing it early. What's the risk that businesses take uh, if they if they don't do this? Yeah. Oh, it's such a great question, and it's so salient right now because. Maybe you remember the SVB uh, bank collapse, right? There's in the startup world. I live right here. (laughs) (laughs) Right. You probably heard about it. Um, So we work with a lot of other startups, right? Other startups provide services to us. And um, there are a lot of great startups out there, a lot of great solutions out there, but there are also startups that perhaps, you know, like us are growing and scaling and there's a reputational risk. I'll, I'll give you an example here and I'm not going to obviously call out the company, but there uh, was a company out there that was working in the HR space, the, you know, HRIS solutions. And I found out that they didn't have a compliance team until just a few months ago. Wow. And that has created some issues, right, around taxation and around compliance. And so from my perspective, I see those things. And I I think to Mm -hmm. your point about SEC regulations, right, if we're not prepared for these things, um, there could be a huge reputational risk to us and and just a risk of of failure, right, where we may have to do things like RIFs or restructure, things that become very, very messy as you get bigger. So for me, I'm always thinking about what's the worst case scenario and how do, how do I avoid that? Mm-hmm, absolutely. Um, so, so far we've gotten to talk a little bit about compliance and the tactical, you know, um, elements uh, process, right, of, of the role. I'd love to understand your approach towards the people. Yeah. Uh, people, yeah. culture, and I'm curious, maybe from an onboarding to offboarding, the whole end to end, employee end-to-end experience, what yeah. that's like with, yeah, with you. Yeah, I, I'll say first that culture is an interesting word because I think mm-hmm. a lot of folks think that culture is something that you can build really deliberately. And to a certain mm-hmm. extent, the more the more effort you put into it, certainly, but ultimately culture comes down to does what you do day-to-day align with what you say you do? right? Mm-hmm. Culture is is a thing that exists no matter what you say. And the two can be different. So I think about that a lot, right? What is the new hire experience, right? Because mm-hmm. to them, that's the culture. The culture is when they come in on day one, uh, we've created a lot of things at Nithio like standard operating procedures, which you know previously existed as just a Google Doc, we're now moving that into Notion, right? Making it a mm-hmm. little bit more of a user-friendly experience. We've also done things like onboarding buddies because we have, we're, we're remote, but we have hubs in Nairobi, in Lagos, in Washington, DC, We've got wow. some folks in Europe. So what we want to do is we want to kind of honor the unique culture that each of those locations has, right? Mm-hmm. Nairobi, they love to get together. They're very social. So that's one way of onboarding, right? They, theirs might be a bit different than Lagos, where it's harder to come into the office, kind of like DC or probably San Francisco, where the traffic <laughs> is awful, right? So they have to kind of get onboarded in a more deliberate way because it's not going to be necessarily in person. So to your question about the whole kind of, I guess, life cycle of onboarding to offboarding. Or or just real quick, I I hadn't even thought of that, right? Like 
we're a remote team. I've worked with remote teams in the past. We work with a lot of remote teams today. I didn't even think about that consideration where the experience can be different because people come from different parts of the world. That's uh, really incredible that you that you design your process around that. Um, this is very dumb of me, but I just thought, oh, like if you join a company, you just follow their culture. But no, yeah. no it's the other way around. It, yeah, know, I that. think so. I think that that's what works best, right? Because what you see is sometimes these these individual cultures pop up, right? Just naturally. Um, mm-hmm. And we wouldn't want to fight that and say, oh, no, here's the Nithya mm-hmm. way of doing things, right? Doing things rather. We want to work with what makes the most sense. And yeah, in some cities, they just don't want to come into the office as much. And that's okay, right? So we also have to honor that, that preference. Um, But yeah, back to the kind of the middle, right? Which is once you're once you're employed, and you've read the notion, and you've met your onboarding buddy, and you've maybe gone into your your co working space, then there's this real, I think, challenge of maintaining a culture when you're remote, right? When you have folks in different time zones. I think one of my team members is nine, 10 hours, right? Difference. So we do some things like affinity groups where we're we're very active on Slack. Uh, We have Blue Sky, which are kind of like our all hands meetings. We do those once a week. And we don't use those necessarily as update sessions. We use those more as like we have DJs, we share meetings. Oh, wow, really? Yeah, I mean, we want to kind of get to know each other, right? Because I only see my Nairobi team maybe once a year. And so we do try and connect more on a personal level. I think that that's important rather than doing that. I've done it before with the all hands and the the, everybody shares all their updates. And we do have a short uh, Monday morning coffee chat where we do that kind of short updating. But but yeah, when we're getting together across time zones, we try to make it fun. (laughs) <laughs> that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Um, and what about the end of the employee experience? What is that like? Yeah. Um, you know, I think we try to treat it with a similar amount of care that we do the whole process, right? And and I've I've worked, as I said, with people for almost 20 years. And what I try and tell folks over the course of their life with a company is that we're here to support you. And if that means mm-hmm. that you're ready to move on to the next role and we don't, maybe we don't have that for you, you know, I'm happy to work with my network to, to find you, wow. maybe somebody else that you would want to talk to. Um, I think we try to just be really human about it, right? And knowing that in the climate world, and you know this in tech, it's a really small world. So Mm -hmm. you never know who you're going to work with again, or who you're going to come across again. So I think we try and just set everybody up for success and say, if you're ready to go, you know, we're always sad to see folks go. But at the same time, I think it's great when when folks move on and, and move on to bigger and better things. And hopefully we'll see them again. Last night, I had an hour and a half call with somebody I met in 2016. Yeah. Somebody who like I started working with and they believed in me and we're still talking. Yeah, you never know. <laughs> yeah. And, and then, you know, um, I, I love that mentality. I love how you explained how it makes sense, right? The world is small. You set them up for success, right? People, it, it, people are people, right? Yeah. Um, it, it comes back to you and and people help each other out. Uh, and I think that's a very beautiful thing. Um, listening to you talk about people and operations, um, there's a lot of, I hear a lot of wisdom in there, right? A lot of wisdom. And I, and I see a lot of experience uh, throughout your career. Um, could, you, could you tell us a little bit, because you, you did mention you were jumping all over the place in a sense, yeah. um, what that journey was like? Yeah. Yeah, so I'll give you the kind of the short version because it's been, you know, 17 years. There's been a lot, but I started off very young in the beauty industry. And I actually started working for Estee Lauder, which is a multi billion dollar corporation, right? So that's one kind of indoctrination because Estee Lauder has a lot of resources and they do things a certain way. And I very quickly moved up to become a a manager, a manager of people and teams. 
So for me, that always came really naturally, right? I think that that was my skill set is working with people, understanding their strengths and deploying them appropriately, right? So that they can be successful. And I did that at Estee Lauder and then at a couple of uh, startups for about a decade. So that was very, very fulfilling. It's very different, Estee Lauder and startups. Yeah, I will say, I so I spent seven years at Estee Lauder, and then I went to a startup that was founded by a husband and wife duo, very small, but they did get acquired by Macy's right, right after I left. So they were moving on up, right? But yeah, that was a complete culture shock because I realized, like, there is no HR, <laughs> right? <laughs> You know, all of the the hiring and the firing, unfortunately, that I had done at Estee Lauder, I mean, I was now really a team of one. Mm -hmm. Uh, But I think that that was a really informative part of my career because I got to see both sides of the coin, right? Of like, here's a very structured um, way of doing things that a big corporation, maybe like a Google or anybody has, you know, the big companies have that infrastructure. Well, and here's a startup that has none of that. And I liked them both in different ways. To me, I've always just kind of collected experiences and tried to use them as ways to inform how I think and how I do things. Hmm. But um, after about a decade in beauty, I've always been the kind of person who's had a lot of different passions and a lot of different interests. So to me, it was normal to feel, and some somebody calls this a magic moment where I had a moment of, you know, hey, I can't see myself working in beauty until I'm 50 or 60 or whatever it might be. I'm really passionate about climate. I think I have some skills. I've been working for a decade. So I went back to school. I got a degree in uh, energy and sustainability. And then I found, I tried to find a job. I really looked for anything that was out there in the climate world. And I ended up at a nonprofit called RMI. Um, but I actually had to come in there at a very junior level, right? So I had all this experience. I was working at the director level. There just wasn't a huge climate world of opportunities out there. And um, I will say, not to make it sound like it's all rainbows and unicorns, I was not good at the first job I had (laughs) at (laughs) all. Not at all. But luckily, I was able to move into other roles and and to start working with different teams and to start to keep building that experience. So I've never looked back. What what was the challenge uh, during the search? Because you had all this experience. Was it just because the climate was a totally different industry, different needs for your role? No, I think it was the role. You know, I had always been or, or I had been up until that point, almost for a decade, a people manager, right? So I was the person making decisions, training teams, hiring people. When I came into RMI, I was an executive assistant. And I was more of like in a support role. Yeah. And I'm just not a good support person. I'm not, I, really want, I can't really plan things. You know, there's a lot of people who are better at doing that than, than I was. But I learned a lot. You know, it was looking back, it was really informative, but it felt very difficult. Um, wow. I, I love to, there's two things. Let me start with this. Um, transitioning to climate, that was, that must, I hear, that sounds like a, a very big leap because you, you had to, you know, put a pause on the career path you built so far. You, you know, invested in school and you, um, you know, got into a, a new job, new industry, everything's new. What was the motivator behind that? Uh, what was, it? yeah, 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 why did you do that? <laughs> yeah, it's, <laughs> that's a good question. Why would you do this? I mean, I definitely think about that sometimes. Of why did I do this? It's turned out really well. I have no regrets, but I, I just always felt as if, and maybe this is a little cliche in the tech world, but you should fail fast or or be be able to pivot, right? Make decisions quickly. And so I just felt as if I think I was just turning 30 and, you know, you have that moment of existential crisis where you think, oh my gosh, what am I going to do now? And so uh-huh. I decided to completely overhaul my whole life. And um, I've always felt very strongly that I've been driven. I've been, you know, very goal oriented. So to me, 
as a lover of spreadsheets, I just kind of thought, well, I can put this in a spreadsheet. I can go back to school. I'll find a job. I'll have some goals and I'll work towards them. So that to me made it feel less scary. Um, was there something about climate in particular that, because you, you, you made a lot of sacrifices to, yeah. to be working in this space and be making this impact yeah. right, on climate. Yeah, I, I felt ever since I was a child, and, and this is like back in the 90s when, you know, the books on climate were very different, right? The climate science even at that time was like very different, but everyone knew it was happening. And so I remember reading just books as a very nerdy child about climate and, and always feeling like, oh man, out of all the problems you could tackle in the world, that would be a good one. And okay. I never, you know, I never stopped caring about it. I was always really interested. I had some friends back when I lived in DC who ended up working in climate. So I always had a bit of a connection. And so to me, it was just natural, right? It was just, this is one of my real interests and passion. And I think I could make a difference with my skill set. And yeah, it wasn't a hard decision. I know it sounds like it, it was a big monumental one, but to huh. me it wasn't because I really, I was so excited. I felt really like honored to be able to work in a field that I had no business being in until, you know, until maybe the past few years. So yeah, I was really excited to do it. Your, your story is amazing to me. And, and, and I relate to so much of it too. You mentioned, you know, uh, a little earlier back, going from a big company to a smaller com to startup. Um, several, you know, in 2015, I was working at a co company called Microsoft, mm -hmm. and then I left to found my own startup. And just the motivation for for me during that time was, at a big company, you you had a very narrow focus. Yep. And in fact, there were restrictions on what you can and can't do outside of your focus, right? if there were things I wanted to learn and personally I learned by experience by doing and making mistakes, failing fast, um, I lacked that opportunity. And I had that at a startup. You, you said um, <laughs> when you were 30, for me, it was 31. Just when yeah. I stopped being 30, you know, yeah. I was like, Oh shoot. I, uh, I gotta, something's gotta change. Yeah. Uh, it's what, what do you think it is about 30? Like why? <laughs> why? That's so arbitrary. It is arbitrary, but it's also not arbitrary, right? It's just a very even number after your after your 20s, I guess. And for me, you know, yes, it was being 30, but it was also seeing the climate crisis continue to get worse and worse. So I think for me, it was kind of like, okay, well, here's a nice even number. I've been in uh, mm. the beauty world for a decade. Maybe it's time to do something else. I could have a completely different career. I've got plenty of time. So for me, it was all of those things. This, this is a bit of a vague question, but I'm curious, now that you're in climate, what, what are you hoping, what, what, what impact are you hoping to contribute to? Yeah. What is the change that you hope to see? Yeah, I think it's really important that we are honest about the moment that we're in. And that's why I'm choosing to work at Nithio and the things that we're working on right now, right? Because there's a lot to do when it uh, when it comes to decarbonization. And by and large, in the developed world, I guess you could say, we have the solutions. We just have to find the political will to deploy them, right? So for me, I spent a little bit of time working on U.S. Uh, consulting with U.S. companies. To me, that wasn't the highest and best use of my time because those solutions exist. Mm. Again, I don't know that we need more people solving that. To me, there's this whole world of emerging economies that haven't even had the opportunity to have electricity. And we can't ask them to then contribute to the climate change problem, right? We can't say, oh, no, you can't use fossil fuels or you can't electrify your communities because we've used up the whole carbon budget because yeah, we messed it up <laughs> right yeah that's mm. just not not acceptable to me so i think if we can kind of solve both where we're providing energy access to these communities who haven't had it mm. in a sustainable way right that isn't wood burning stoves and it's not diesel and natural gas a sustainable process early yeah exactly yeah yeah reasons. Right. Who knew if you start off doing things the right way, you have less to clean up. So to me, yeah, that's 
that's, I think my niche right now is, is working on getting some of these folks up to the rest of the world, the standard that we've all enjoyed, right. They deserve it as well. Um, I have a scary question, scary for me, scary question to ask you for people, for our audience members who aren't working in climate, you being in climate, right. Closer than, than any of us. Um, do you think we could do it? <laughs> the world, you know, the humans, <laughs> people. I I go back and forth pretty dramatically on this question, and I do think about it a lot because it does. I, I'm just kind of a sensitive person. I grew up in Washington D.C., where I've seen a lot of the politics around any problem. Right? We might have the solution, but it's something else to actually solve it. Um. So I would say. Largely, yes, I think we I think we will. I think we may just eke it out, right? Maybe like right, I don't know, what's a sports analogy, right? Like right, I don't know, in the end zone the yeah. last minute. I, I think I think we might. I we we probably will. <laughs> I don't know if that's a an overwhelming positive response. Yeah, it's, I mean that's great for me to hear because I, I hear a lot of almost all only the opposite, you know. So yeah. um Here's my last, last question. Um, or here's my last question. Um, a while back, you mentioned your career journey and you developing, you go, oh, people management is where I want to be, right? I was curious, and you mentioned you grew up in DC. I'm just curious where that came from. Um, what was it that might have happened before that when you got to uh, experience people management, that you went, oh yeah, this is it. But hmm. you mentioned you know, sort of why you liked it, right? Like enabling and helping and solving problems and with people specifically, where did that come from? Yeah, I think it's always just been innate. Um, and, and maybe what I'll say is I had a manager very early on, like six months into my career at Estee Lauder, who said to me that I had too many questions. And I took that very personally because I'm still, I'm mentioning it now 17 years later, but I <laughs> use that to kind of inform the way I think about managing people, right? Because maybe six months after that, I was all of a sudden in her position. And I think there's two real keys to being good at what you do. And the first is to be curious. And the second is to be teachable. And so I always strive to find people who are both of those things. Because to me, there's nothing more special in the world than finding somebody like that. And I have many times on my team where you can grow that person, you can work with them, you know, they work well with you, you're able to really maximize your impact in your job, but also to see that person, you know, have maybe some of the opportunities that that I had, right, where somebody just took a chance and said, yeah, you'd be a good manager. And um, yeah, I don't know, I just really... I love working with people. I think it's just an innate, you know, some people are good with numbers or good with good with data. For me, it's always been working with people and maybe identifying what makes them tick and helping them learn and helping them grow. I get a real satisfaction out of that. Uh, that manager who said you asked too many questions, the the takeaway that you got from it was that that not only do I have to be curious, I also need to be teachable. Was 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 that? Yeah, I think so. I think so, right? Because oh. maybe that was valid feedback that she had for me, right? And I didn't take it as it was going to stop me. I took it instead as, oh, I didn't mm. realize that people had a negative or that people were annoyed by questions, right? I guess for me, I was always just a curious kid and everybody indulged me and it, it got me pretty far in life. So yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah I think- I, I, I usually have trouble with uh, uh, people not asking enough questions. <laughs> I agree. I agree. I think it's really yeah, helpful yeah. Just tell people ask ask the dumb questions. I don't mind. I um, I have a slightly adjacent uh, um, perspective and passion with with working with people. Um, honestly, it might have waned a little bit, but when I was in in school, when I was in college, uh, I I I I was a very bad learner. Um, I worked really hard and I thought I could just memorize my way through school. Yeah. Uh, I didn't know how to learn yet. Mm -hmm. And so I struggled a lot. And 
when professors, for example, like researchers, right? They're not, mm-hmm. not professors first, they're researchers first. Professor second, and they teach you something, and I just don't, I get it, I don't get it, I don't understand. And a lot of, and I, I went into teaching a little bit uh, after that, but a lot of that came from, um, like, because, ah, because I did have an, a, a first internship uh, at, at the NSA and my manager there, even though I sucked at learning, right? I tried really hard. He uh, took his budget to send me and one other student uh, to three boot camps, um, yeah. cybersecurity boot camps. And that was one of the first time, and I, I, I've had, you know, recurring from when I was a kid to now, just people handing me opportunity. Yeah. And even though I felt like I didn't deserve it. <laughs> and um, to your point about, you know, growing people and, 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 I don't know. I just uh, always really hoped that with opportunity, with support, with resources and helping answer questions, encouraging asking questions, um, that, 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 that you could help, you know, uh, yeah. grow people and also grow yourself too in the process. Yeah. Um, but uh, you just reminded me of that because it's been a while since I thought about that. It, honestly, yeah. Yeah. Well, and somebody saw that in you, right? They saw that you were trying really hard. You might have been working in the wrong way, but but right. that innate sense, like that's, you can see that, right? And you can see, oh man, this person is interested. They're invested. And that's just so exciting, right? Because not everybody, some people just want to come to work and do their jobs right. and that's fine. But the people who really want to learn and grow, like that's so satisfying. And yeah, you do have to pay it forward, I think. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, well, here's the last, last question. Uh, thank you so much for speaking with us. Um, for our community, what's the best way to reach you and, and who should reach out to you? Yeah. Uh, so you can reach me via LinkedIn. You can just search Annabelle Sullivan. I'll pop up. Or my email is a.sullivan at nithio.com. And uh, Speaking of paying it forward, I love to speak to folks who are either trying to get into climate or Mm -hmm. who maybe had that different background, right? Maybe it's more retail or it's something completely different. I'm happy to talk about, again, my my journey and folks who are interested in um, energy access, climate tech, feel free to, to drop me a line. I'm always happy to have a coffee chat. And, and links will be in the description, but a quick follow-up. You mentioned your journey into climate. It was very competitive. It was very scarce. It was maybe not as developed as it is now. If there are people who are interested in going into climate, what is it, what does the landscape look like now? Oh my gosh, it is so different. I find every day I find more and more communities. There's groups called Women in Climate. There's Terra.do. They're a big one where they have a big job board. There are an insane amount of webinars and resources that can kind of guide you through it, which is so funny, right? I'm like, I should write one of these because I can maybe help somebody. But but yeah, I would just encourage even just like a simple Google search I found turns up so many resources that just simply didn't exist even five you know, years ago. Absolutely. And and the uh, uh, LinkedIn and, and uh, contact information will be in the description. Uh, and then the last plug uh, for us. Uh, hey, folks, you manage a remote team. Uh, you can start managing devices for free for up to five employees at Swift.ai. Uh, and special promotion for podcast listeners. If you like Swift, want to add more employees, last time you came from the podcast, we'll give you 20% off the upgrade. And if you know someone who could benefit from device management or compliance, uh, refer us and you get a $100 referral bonus. All right. And thank you so much, Annabelle, for speaking with us. Um, I, I got so many nuggets of wisdom from, from what you said. I love your story and showing us how you took that leap to go into climate, your passion for climate, your passion for people. Thank you so much for speaking with us today. Yeah. Thanks so much, Jeremy. It was really fun. Absolutely. And, and we'll see you all next time.